Hello again. Welcome back to China Manufacturing Decoded, the podcast from the Sophist Group. Adrian here from the team, and our CEO Renault joins me as he often does. Hey, hi, Renault. Hi there. Yeah. How's it going? Good, thank you. I'll just say, just right now, just in case any listeners do hear some noise, there's a bit of banging going on in the background here. So uh, my apologies for that. Hopefully, <laughs> disruption will be minimised. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you're back in you're back in Hong Kong as we discussed last week. Of course, not the same as going to China, but one of one of the good points that you did mention was that at least for Hong Kong, the mechanism of getting back into the territory is a lot more streamlined these days with regards oh, yeah. to COVID stuff. Oh yeah, if I compare with last year when I came back, let me see, early October I think, I flew uh, from Europe to to Hong Kong and. Yeah, the process at the airport was long. You arrive, you had to do PCR tests, you had to wait for a while, and they had like early results, and then you could go through the rest of the stuff, and uh, um, and then it was three weeks of quarantine, and it was just like really, really, you, you really had to be motivated to fly back. And this time, you arrive, you yeah, you get tested, but they don't even wait, and you keep going, and and um, it's it's much streamlined, and then go into your hotel you do three nights and you go out and for the next four days you cannot go to restaurant or bar but you can with a mask on go to offices and general place you know like uh, supermarkets and things like that so not not bad at all you know getting better and better and uh, a lot of people yeah. expect that three days of quarantine will get down to maybe one night or maybe zero uh, mm. you know probably with Still, with some some testing at you know periodic testing in the first week and or the first ten days, should I say, and still with um, without the possibility to go to restaurants for the first week, probably. But you know, it, it's good enough if people are motivated to come to um, to trade shows. I see some uh, some activities going on. Uh, the, the companies that used to uh, to 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 run trade shows in Hong Kong are are going to uh, to do it again in October. Global sources for sure. They, they contacted me for for speaking there, so they have a uh, they have a plan for for something, right? <laughs> so let's see. Because if Hong Kong stays out of the out of the loop for too long, I mean, there's going to be irreparable damage. One of my clients that I saw in uh, in in Europe, um, when was that? Three weeks ago. Or four weeks ago, they deal with toys, and they were saying, "Well, you know, Hong Kong used to be the uh, the hub for you know for the hub in, for the toy industry, but if it gets closed for too long, you know, it's getting eclipsed by Los Angeles or you know who knows what. But yeah. you know, fewer and fewer people are going to um, to go there. Uh, it loses its relevance, doesn't it, as an international yeah, exactly. hub? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you can see it already after two and a half years. Mm. There are pretty bad damages. A lot of companies have closed and or downsized and, and, and things like that. So um yeah, yeah, I think uh, people are starting to okay. be aware now of the, the heavy cost of yeah you know, of, the, of these measures. Well, the good thing is Hong Kong now, I, I guess you would agree, if you if you need to go to Hong Kong and you're listening to this, it's kind of doable now rather than before when it was crazy. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Yes, yes. Okay. However, China absolutely not the same. I mean, the, the quarantine is less. It's it's seven days, but I mean, it's it's probably a much more complicated process, and I'm not sure that they're extremely welcoming to foreign visitors uh, uh, <laughs> right now in comparison to Hong Kong. So. With our eyes still on China, I did want to just quickly talk about some of the news coming out of China that does affect mm. manufacturing, and that's the mm. heat wave and also drought that's being suffered in parts of the country. Right, right, right. So there have been very strong heat waves. Very strong, I don't know, because, I mean, in China, people are not really complaining about it so much. You know, in Zhejiang, in Jiangsu, in some, Anhui, and so on, they are used to the thermometer going up, you know, 38, 39. Uh, now, you know, sometimes yeah. over 40. I remember yeah. once I was in Iwu and he, it was 43. <laughs> and it was Whoa. like 10 years ago, right? So um, I still remember that number though. <laughs> but now it's been 
pretty much around 40 for, for, for some time. And also around uh, Sichuan and Chongqing, um, let's say, you know, closer to the Himalayas, but still sort of central to China. And there's, you know, there's a little river going through uh, through Chongqing uh, called the Yangtze. And, and its level is is extremely low uh, these days. People are really shocked. And that has a number of consequences. Uh, and, 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 you know, one of them is that the Three Gorges Dam cannot really produce much electricity these days. Yeah. Uh, while at the same time, households and also companies, of course, but you know, people are pulling as much as they can from the air conditioning which consumes a lot of electricity. So uh, there's not enough electricity to power everything and to prevent brownouts or even blackouts. They have told manufacturing companies in the Chongqing area to basically shut down. And, you know, like, they even say it is going to be shut down indefinitely. Now let, let let's see where it goes. Yeah. Right, and maybe uh, by the time this podcast goes live, uh, they will have um, um, uh, how to say reopened a little bit, restarted. Mm. But Chongqing is a large area. It's actually it's a city, but it's also a province, right? Yes, and um, it, it's it's huge. It's huge. Before when Chongqing was part of Sichuan, it was the most populous uh, province of China, I believe. So it's, it, it, Chongqing is huge. Um, and there's a lot of manufacturing there. A lot of uh, automotive business has been going there. It's been quite dynamic for the past uh, 10, 15 years. Um, and, and and there's also electronics there, uh, especially the, the kind of small and valuable electronics that can just be shipped by air anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's close to a seaport or not. So there's a lot of that in that area and it's it's affected. So oh, yeah. Let's see where it goes, but it's another one of these risk fa- factors, you know. Um, high heat plus uh, plus drought in your area, or, you know, in the area where you, you manufacture or that that that's not good. That's not good for manufacturing. Yeah, hopefully it's not the new normal, but I mean, it's not looking great, is it? So this is yet another thing that we need to keep our eye on when we are sourcing. So if there is any more news about how manufacturing in that part of West China is being affected, we'll let everybody know. But yeah, good to right. good to know the situation. I mean, West China is not normally so well known for its manufacturing, but uh, Chongqing mm-hmm. and maybe parts of Sichuan, they absolutely are, mm-hmm. aren't they? Uh, yeah, again in automotive and mm. and increasingly in uh, in in uh, in electronics. And I re- I remember some some factory owners in 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 Shenzhen. Uh, they were kind of proud. Oh, we uh, we're setting up a new manufacturing place over there because it's hydroelectricity, and mm. you know our customers love it because it's not powered by coal. Well, <laughs> that's true. But if you go there and you consume the hydroelectricity from the the, the big dam, uh, anyway, China has to 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 burn more coal to uh, you know because hydroelectricity doesn't cover um, as much as it should. Anyway, mm. it's uh, but yeah, th- there's been a bunch of factories um, set up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So keep an eye on that. Let's move on to today's topic. And this is actually a really great one. I I love this one that you suggested. So we're going to be looking into in detail at how much cash (laughs) will a new product need to prototype and to launch? And this is a question I think that we probably get asked quite often by new clients, right? Yeah, and they, they come to us and very often they're still in the conceptual phase or they start mm-hmm. to do a little bit of design. They start to do some, you know, something, but they, they think that um, someone can really put a number on it. But uh, depending on, you know, what way they go and how ambitious they are, 
you know, it, it could be in some cases, it could be twenty thousand dollars, it could be two hundred thousand dollars, or even more, right? So, um, mm. it depends on the, the ambitions, right? So, and I think this is the first thing to mention. If you want to keep your product simple, if you don't think you're going to make it in large numbers, if you just want to reuse standard modules, standard components as much as possible, if you're not going to be very, very tight on quality of finishing and so on and so forth, you know, and pushing the envelope on on, on, on certain aspects of the development, if you don't do all of that, um, you know, uh, your version one can be out in the market much faster and mm. with much lower investment. Now, if you do the opposite, you, you, you're you basically shooting for a complicated product, it's pushing the envelope, and, and, you know, it means it's carrying a lot of technical risk. Uh, it's probably going to be much more complicated and much more expensive than than, than it than it appears. And, um, you know, in the end, you might crumble under all of this cost, and mm-hmm. it's going to be so slow that no investor will... Uh, will get excited and then you you invest everything you can and then you run out of cash right and then people tend to even pile up mistakes on top of mistakes uh, they have a version one and they think it's genius so they pay they, they, they go for an ip lawyer and they they go for a full-blown patent of course not a provisional patent you know they want the, the real thing right away because they feel so confident and then they Oh, there's some issues, and they see that they need to make some changes because otherwise it cannot be manufactured or, or whatever. Maybe or maybe the the cost of the finished product would be so high, and then version two, and they want to to patent it again, and so on and so forth. And cash just just runs out very fast in these cases, right? Mm. And they want to design some of the the modules themselves from scratch, and it all has to be uh, tested and certified and everything. And they want um, they want that very specific component that has to be imported into China, and the minimum of the quantity is 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 large and has to be purchased long in advance. And you know, and you 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 shell out um, half a million dollars for that, <laughs> you know, and you ha- you still have no idea when your first manufacturing run is going to be. It's just nuts. On on the one hand. You would say it's it's really nuts, uh, but on the other hand, it is a trap that a lot of entrepreneurs tend to fall into because it's just their nature. They tend to be over optimistic, and frankly, if you want to design and and develop and launch a new hardware product that's totally new, uh, especially if it's got electronics and 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 you know and, and it's relatively ambitious, well, well, well. Uh, you got to be uh, over optimistic you know you you got to downplay the risks and you got to downplay all the all all the potential issues and you you because if you know everything you're just going to get crushed and say oh it's so big i, I you know i don't want to go into that it's huge mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the nature of people there's a, there's definitely a psychology uh, element to it yeah uh, and uh, it's very hard to tell someone because they come to you and they say, well, I have this, you know, it's, it's, it's a great product and like, I'm sure it's going to work. And you say, well, you know, have you done some market research and stuff? Uh, look, I'm sure it's going to work. And like, uh, I'm going to go into it like fully invested and da, 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 and I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get some investors and stuff. Don't worry about that. You know, let's get, let's just get going. Okay, well, it's good to be enthusiastic, but you know you're not objective, and it's and some people get so blinded by that when they look back at it one year or two years later after it was a huge failure and they lost a lot of money, they think, well, what was I thinking, right? But it's um again, it's it's human nature, right? If if you if you ask one hundred people, are you a better driver than average? You know, ninety percent of people say yes, right? So, but yeah. obviously cannot be more than 50 percent so that's human nature okay so with, with with that sort of psychological element out of the way uh, it's important to to know how to break it down and th- there's, there's a nice 
how to say, a nice breakdown, a nice analysis that is uh, suggested by a textbook that I referred to before. It's called Product Realization Going from One to One Million, right? It's yeah. a great textbook. I'll leave the link in the show notes. Yeah, right. It, it, it's really nice. So I'm not going to read from it or, or anything, but I'm just saying, you know, if people want to know more, that's where they will find a lot of good information. And we also have some some resources about uh, non-recurring in engineering and so on. I guess we can leave some links to that also. Um, mm. So what you want to know basically is three things. Three big numbers that you want to know. First is to get to the, the the point where I'm ready to manufacture, how much cash do I have to put in? And that's just going to be like digging a big hole because at that point you haven't had any revenue yet, any, any money in, except if maybe you do uh, a crowdfunding campaign such as a Kickstarter campaign, uh, or if you, if you start to pre-sell, uh, you know, and, and, Maybe in a in in a B two B market, there's a few big customers that really need the product, and they can they can um, give you some advanced payments and things like that. Okay, these are smart ways to go around that. But generally, um, was the investment to be ready for manufacturing, right? Uh, and that usually is called uh, non recurring engineering. So, is all the work you do to be ready? Okay. Uh, and 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 it does include some tooling and 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 so on, right? And certification costs and so on. It, it's a very wide, uh, very big bucket. Then the second one is how much is the unit cost going to be, right? Mm. Once we have invested all that money, and maybe there's a plastic injection molding enclosure and things like that, we have the tooling. We know the 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 cost per part is going to be. You know, whatever one point eight dollars and da, 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 for this, and then there's the board, and then there's these components, and then da, 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 and the packaging, right? You add everything up. You have your bill of material, and you have the the assembly work. You have the the testing and inspection costs, the packaging, and you know, all of that work. And then you say, well, I can make this at a total cost, um, you know, out of the factory of whatever 12.5 dollars us and then to that you need to add transportation cost maybe the tariffs if it's on the wrong uh, list and you you send to the us for example uh the import duties etc cetera, etc cetera. that's your landed cost okay so that's really what what is going to cost you and maybe maybe warehousing on your side right so how much is it going to cost you Maybe to 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 make a batch of ten thousand, and then that gives you the unit price, right? So that's your cost. So first, it was sort of your investment, if you want, just to be ready. Then, when you pull the trigger, okay, how much you have to put in to get a batch, you know, and and what's the cost per piece? And then the third one, obviously, is the sales. How much can you sell it for? And 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 that means how much margin you can make, right? And obviously, you also need to take into account. Any returns, you know, especially if you offer a warranty and all the after sale costs. And you might even need to subsidize the, the distribution partners, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things that might happen. Okay. But how, how much are you going to get, right? Once you have the product. So you, you, you might have some very different profiles from one product to the other. It might be a product where the, the cost to be ready, you know, all the non recurring engineering, uh, the tooling, et cetera, et cetera, is low. It might be $20,000, might be $10,000. Maybe there's no tooling at all. You know, it's a simple product. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the cost might be, I don't know, $5 uh, landed or, or $20 landed. Let's say $20 landed. And then you're going to sell it. But since it's relatively undifferentiated product, maybe at the end of the day, when you remove the, what you expect uh, from the returns and so on and so forth, maybe the cost of financing and so on, 
maybe you only make a margin of uh, you know three dollars per piece, right? Or five dollars or more. You know, when you do your projections, usually you you tend to project more, but then when you really count the pennies at the end of the year, maybe it's mm. not that much, right? If you need to do some um, some advertising, some uh, whatever pay per click, some Facebook ads, and that's very common nowadays. Uh, you might have to do that to push a crowdfunding campaign. You might have to do that to push your e-commerce website. You know, you, you you might be addicted to that to generate some sales. So or you might have to pay for in-store promotions. You might have to go there yourself to do demonstrations of the product to to shoppers, all kinds of things like that. That's mm-hmm. costly, right? Um, and then in some some you know a little bit of a different. Um, different scenario would be the the full investment is maybe uh, you know you're ambitious you go ahead and you do a mobile app and you do this and you do that and it's an like electronic product you have a bunch of certifications to to, to do and and maybe the total cost is a hundred fifty thousand dollars us or two hundred thousand dollars us but you have a very unique product and it come you know your full cost might be $25, but then the retail cost is going to be maybe the first year $150. And what you will get out of that is maybe $90, right? Much higher margin. So depending on the volume, it might be worth it, might not be worth it. But you can see why you need to do these kinds of calculations. You need to do sort of a business plan uh, just to make sure, you know, as a sanity check, are you going to invest a ton of money, but actually realistically you cannot really make enough margin to uh, to justify it? Or you're just losing a lot of money plus a lot of time to manage it and so on and so forth. And also yeah. if you're going to need to raise money from investors, same idea. That you know, It might be difficult to convince, convince an investor if you can't even show a forecast of your financials, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, there are, you know, if you look online and, and there's even software nowadays that, that help you put, put you know, the plug your numbers and then they will do the calculations and they will forecast and, you know, five years out and all kinds of things like that. So that's not really the difficult part of it. The difficult part is to to plug numbers that make sense. Mm. And if you're doing this for the first time, you're going to forget a lot of a lot of things. Uh, but maybe we can run through um, a little bit of a breakdown. Again, if I refer to that um, that textbook, let's take the three three elements that I mentioned. Right, first one is how much to invest just to be ready, uh, ready for production, which means much more than be ready. You know like have a nice prototype, right? Yes. Yeah. You need to do the tooling, you need to do the certifications, you, know, you need to do reliability testing, you need to do, you need to set up the lines and, and do a pilot run, et cetera, et cetera. And number two was, what's the unit cost uh, based on the assumption of a batch of, for example, 5,000 pieces? Uh, how much really is it going to cost you to get it landed on the markets and ready to, uh, ready to be sold? Uh, and and number three is you sell it, how much money can you really get, you know, net of your marketing investments, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, marketing expenses, I should say, if it's just to generate the, the, the sales directly, right? So these are one, two, three uh, buckets. And so let's take the first one, which again is usually called NRE, non-recurring engineering. First, the engineering design, who's going to do it? Is it going to be your team? Um, are you, you know, do you need to hire some people? Are you yourself going to learn some of these technologies and, 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 and do it? Are you going to subcontract it maybe to a, um, a design house? There's a number of different approaches here, right? You know, if it's a complex new product, that's a substantial amount of money. Sometimes just that, is uh, you know, is above fifty thousand or eighty thousand US dollars, um, sometimes much more. 
right? So, you know, and you have the industrial design work, you have the, maybe the mechanical and structural design, you have the electronic design, maybe you need to also um, need to do firmware, you need to do maybe a mobile app, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you might also need some project management and, you you know, who's going to buy the, the parts to put the prototype together? Who's going to test the prototypes, right? And there's a lot of discovery in the early prototypes, the, the proof of concept and the early prototypes. So accept some iterations. And if you have a a budget that's, you know, that can accommodate more iterations, your product design will be better. If you do reliability testing, especially um, to 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 push the, the the products to failure, to know the, the the limitations of the design, just to make a better design that's more reliable, more durable, you need you need more time, you need more money, right? So, do you want a great product, or do you want to get to market fast and without spending a lot of money? Right. That, very often, that's a trade-off, and we see people who are so uh, focused on going to market very fast that they, they they kind of skip that and skip some very important steps, and some products fail in the marketplace just because, well, you know, there's there's a weakness, there's an issue that was. Uh, that was known actually, but they just didn't take the time to to go back and fix it. Okay. Now, what else? As I say, there's some testing fees, there's some tooling, some special equipment in some cases, uh, maybe some fixtures for assembly, uh, some um, electronic testing rigs, and so on. Um, and and it always costs a bit more uh, time and money. Uh, or at least that's the way you should budget it, right? Tooling has to be signed off. And if there are some issues after that, you need to send it back for adjustments. That takes time and uh, definitely takes money. So th th these are some um, some of the things here. But if you look at the whole new product, new product introduction process, you, you need to have quality engineers to work on setting up the standard, setting up the checklist and so on, testing the prototypes, et cetera. You, you need process engineers to start to think already on how to, how to set things up, et cetera, et cetera. The more new and complex your product is, the more you need that, okay? Mm. And, and maybe you as a founder need a salary all along. Uh, maybe you need to have a little office. I mean, all of that adds up, right? It adds up. And then you... You're going to ship things around by FedEx. <laughs> All of that really adds up. You got to be careful. Now, the second one is how much is going to cost in production. And the fundamental document for that is the BOM, the Bill of Materials, which is a, a list of all the parts, the, the components, the materials, whatever, uh, including the charger, the, 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 the packaging, etc. Put everything in there as a list and then every line has its own cost, right? The price of that, that component. And sometimes lead times are long, so you need to disburse money earlier. Sometimes minimum order quantity are high. So even though you only need, uh, you know, 2000 pieces for the first batch, you have to buy 50,000 pieces or 20,000 pieces. This, if this is not handled properly at the sourcing stage, uh, you know, when, when your design engineers put together the files and work on the prototypes, at the same time, you should have some supply chain people looking at all of this and try to, uh, to make the right choices, pick the right options for the suppliers, okay? Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a big problem with cash flow. So, when you add up all of the consumption of um, of all of the lines of one product, you have an idea about the bomb cost. Now, on top of the bomb cost, well, the assembly supplier that's going to buy all of this and put it together, they uh, they need to manage the, the suppliers, right? Uh, when there's quality issues, they need to send it back and so on. 
and if they don't even notice it, but then it leads to production issues, it's going to be a, a serious loss for them. So they always add something up. Um, that's what we do. That's what all the contract manufacturers do. If the bomb is much more expensive, it's got to be reflected somehow in the assembly cost, right? Except if the customer is buying all the components and you know it's just an assembly service, right? The service of assembly, the service of testing, the service of uh, packaging. And then in that case, uh, the customer is going to bear these costs, but somebody's going to is going to bear this cost anyway. Uh, especially if it's a again a relatively complex product, and let's say there are fifty um, uh, fifty lines in the in, in the bomb. Well, there's and from maybe uh, forty two different suppliers. Well, some of these suppliers are going to mess up. Right? There's going to be issues to clean up. Mm. Uh, not not to mention. Uh, we work on a product that has more than a thousand lines in the bomb. Now, yeah, that that stuff. <laughs> there are always issues, right, from from the supply base. Except if you if you can if you can be sure you're going to make large volumes. You know, if you buy a car, the bomb has thousands of lines, um, but they they do an um, enormous amount of work on the supply chain to make sure that these kinds of issues don't come up. So. You need to know the, the full cost of the bomb, and, and this you don't really know at the very beginning, right? So you need you need to do a bit of a feasibility study. You need to to at least check the cost of the 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 big, the most expensive components. I don't know the display, the battery, and so on. Or maybe if it's mechanical parts, you know uh, the the big the big parts, especially the custom parts, might be difficult to know at the very beginning. And then. Once you have the total bomb cost and you know what the assembly and testing is going to cost, you need to have a rough estimate of shipping and warehousing. I mean, if, if um, again, if tariffs apply, the tariffs, um, the import duties, everything, right? The insurance on the, on the cargo when shipping, you need to have a rough idea about all this. And that is your total landed cost. Right, and if it's based on a batch of five thousand, it's um, you know you divide by five thousand, and that's your total unit cost. Very, very important because some people sell at a loss. Uh, we we see Kickstarter campaigns that sell at a loss all the time, uh, right? They really underestimate how much it costs, but also products sold to a retailer or um, or, or even on e-commerce websites. When people don't really have an idea about their full costs, they might be selling at a, co- uh, at a loss, right? So they, <laughs> they're better off not doing anything. Is that because they have got themselves into a corner by not being able to calculate the correct price at first? So very often, there's several things that can happen. Number one, the manufacturers in China, if you ask them, oh, hey, can you give me a quote on this? Uh, They're going to make all kinds of assumptions that it's going to be easy and they're going to give you a cost because they know at the very beginning, it's very easy for you to compare costs. So if they want the business, they get to quote low. And then when they start to have more detail, more detail, and they start to work on, on, on things, they see the full extent of the complexity and associated costs and, and they say, well, you know, and oh, and this guy's quality level, you know, the standard is very high. We're going to have a lot of scrap, etc. And then they say, well, <laughs> it's going to have to be 35% more expensive, right? Very common. Also, you you notice that uh, there's, there's some uh, some components that you underpriced in your 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 uh, your forecast. Uh, oh, you didn't think of this cost and that cost. Uh, oh, we need to do this certification. Oh, right. Ooh, ooh, the, ooh. When we add everything up, you know, there's Ten thousand dollars of certification, Ooh. <laughs> um, all kinds of things that they forget. And then on the other side, they want to generate revenue. They want to generate some buzz. They, you know, they want to be aggressive sometimes, and they say, "Well, let's get it out there, and we'll get all kinds of good reviews, and and based on that, we'll uh, you know ride it into the sunset." And uh, you know, we don't need to make a lot of margin in the first batch. We'll make it after that. 
Whew, well, that is dangerous. There's a dangerous way of, of looking at it. Mm. A very dangerous one. So th- these are the two main uh, main issues. Okay. Right. So, yeah, I covered first uh, non-recurring engineering. How much is really going to cost you to get ready for production? Number two is the unit cost, fully burdened. And then number three is how much you're going to get paid really in your pockets, right? Uh, and you get to be very careful because certain things don't really show up in these kinds of calculations. If you're going to get paid by a retailer 90 days out or a B2B uh, customer or something, well, you need to finance all that, right? Mm. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to consume a lot of your cash. Very, very, uh, very dangerous, right? And you, you, you have to account for potential issues, right? There might be quality issues <laughs> more than you think, uh, especially on the first batch, especially if uh, you work with um, a manufacturer that doesn't really know what they're doing. That's always, you know, sort of hoping to be lucky and they don't do the pilot validation runs and they don't do the this and they don't do that. Well, that might be very, very expensive and you might have to get on a, on a flight very often to go here and there. You might have to give rebates to unhappy customers or send some um, some 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 returns. You might find out that, hey, should have worked with a lawyer on that and then you go work with a lawyer and you, 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 you know, all all um all together you have to pay uh, eight thousand dollars in legal fees just to get you covered with the right uh, the right agreements with your manufacturing partner and so on well all of that adds up hmm. it, it's it's a lot of money right and they say yeah. oh and then we had some issues for so from now on we're going to do a couple of uh, product inspections on every batch and we're going to have to fly there every couple of months if you can fly, right? Well, it's China, so you need to hire people to do it instead. Well, somebody's got to pay them, right? So all of that, you know, and then you get some um, some some returns. We talked about that. Uh, you and Andrew talked about that a few episodes ago. But yes. that can bankrupt you, <laughs> you know, in, in a few weeks. And if you have oh. a major safety issue, and you got to do it <laughs> even call. worse. I mean, that's even faster. You go out of yeah. business in a blink, in the blink of an eye. So in a nutshell, you get to plan very carefully. Uh, you get to look for, um, uh, you know, the experiences of others. You need to collect some typical numbers. Uh, you need mm. to talk to, to people. You need, and, and you need to do some of the work early on to get to the point where your product design is relatively mature uh, and then at this point a lot of the, the decisions have been made and you can get to a rough estimate usually but if it's a very immature product design still you could go whichever direction it's very very hard to uh, to know hmm. well it's a lot to think about isn't it i suppose when especially entrepreneurs and some of the smaller SMEs perhaps who are not so accustomed to starting manufacturing a product, they come with these questions and they're really not prepared for the amount of different things that they need to consider to get to the idea of how much of the, I mean, what is basically an investment they're going to need to make. Right. And that's why, that's why we, sometimes we, we tell them, Hey, maybe you should go take a, uh, what uh, a staircase approach, you know, one step at a time. First, yeah. maybe you'll find an ODM manufacturer that has an existing product. You start to to sell that. Then maybe you can work with them to make a few adjustments. Okay, but still, mm. this is not your product. You have pretty much zero control. But then yeah. this allows you to understand your market and understand the needs and the pains of a certain type of customer. Then you can really start to plan for... Uh, building a new product to market and usually you will tend to overcomplicate version one so you need to make um, you know some trade-offs make some decisions and try to launch a relatively simple version one and then all of your cool ideas can come to life in version two version three if version one is economically successful 
right? That is usually the, um, uh, yeah, the, sort of the speech, you know, that, that's what we tell them because uh, people who have no experience in that tend to um, tend to get burned easily. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the part about, you know, splitting up your product concept into more manageable versions. So going with a V1.0 mm. to begin with, which maybe is not as complex or as feature rich as, as your initial concept. That's something that you've spoken about before. And I mean, it just makes so much sense. And I suppose the notion of, yeah, but I've got this great idea and it's got so many great functions. And so we've got to get that to market. That that can take over quite easily, I would imagine, because it's exciting, right? But as we say in England, I don't know about the rest of the world listeners, you know, you need to cut your cloth accordingly. And, right. you know, that's that's trying to make the project more manageable to begin with and get it off the ground. Otherwise, uh, mm. as you said again in the episode, you could even bankrupt yourself trying to trying to get there straight away. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. <laughs> well, so I hope everybody was taking notes. <laughs> lots to uh, <laughs> lots to go through on that uh, on that episode. But yeah, that's a that's a really good explanation of what it takes to start to really understand the kind of investment you're going to need to make to to launch your new product, basically. So mm. yeah, really interesting. Loved it, Renault. Great, and we'll be back next week as we usually are. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com. That's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.